Hi everyone, welcome to Watches and Wonders 2024 and thank you all for being with us here on such a beautiful day. Uh, we'll try to make it, your time worth it, even though the sun is shining outside. Et juste au cas où, pour ceux qui ont besoin de traduction, il y a des écouteurs juste à côté de l'entrée, juste là. Uh, the topic you can see on the screen behind us is towards a non-gendered watch, which might be a little mysterious at first, but it will all become clear in time. I'm joined today by the sparkling Arthur Tusho, who has worn many hats throughout his career and is currently the man behind the creative content at Phillips Watches, a recognized watch expert in his own right, and a published author. I mean, the guy wrote a book, he knows his stuff. Uh, next to him, we have the disruptive Laetitia Ishii, New York-based founder of Caviar uh, Agency, uh, PR and marketing agency Caviar. Throughout her varied career, Laetitia has worked with prestigious brands such as uh, Patek Philippe, Bulgari, Zenith, and Frederick Constant. I'm lucky to count her as a good friend and my fellow co-founder of our non-profit association, Watch Fun, which promotes the voice and role of women in the watch world. Right next to me, we have the radiant Ini Archibong, a multi-hyphenate artist, educator, musician, entrepreneur, who in 2019 designed the Gallop de Mes, a, a watch intended to be free of gender categories, and he will be sharing his take on product design and the thought process that goes into creating for different audiences. And to be honest, this is something I've always wanted to ask someone directly, and we have the chance to have Ini here with us and put some uh, specific questions to him. For my part, I'm Suzanne Wong, as you can see on the screen, um, <laughs> editor-in-chief of the online site World Tempers, which is dedicated to watches and watchmaking. Um, I am your friendly neighborhood moderator, and we will be trying to keep this session short, sweet, and interesting, a bit like me, although uh, the sweet part some people might dispute. Now, my lovely three panelists today, we are going to kick off with a little bit of context and talk about the subject a bit towards a non-gendered watch. And as we all know, to those of you who are coming to the subject for the first time, what does that even mean? Because a watch is an object. It has no gender. However, we do know that when we approach watches in a retail environment, in a sales environment, uh, in a communication sort of environment, in publications and in advertising and so on and so forth, we often hear this phrase being sort of pushed around, these phrases, men's watch, women's watch, in a sense, even though the, the object itself, a watch, has no gender, it has been gendered. Um, what do you guys think of this sort of phenomenon that something that, you know, we can say is just a mechanical object. It doesn't really have any sort of biological um, attributes that can be identified as male or female. What does it mean to you to have a watch that is identified as a men's watch or a women's watch, categorized as such? Arthur, do you want to kick us off since... Uh... With great pleasure. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think you um, hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it is an object, and so it is not gendered. It becomes gendered, right? as soon as it touches someone's skin. But um, it is a non-gendered product. Uh, in fact, in the auction world, if you look at catalogs, uh, you can search watches by brand, by um, price range, but uh, no auction house presents watches as male or female. So it, it is a bit of a strange uh, concept. Um, and in a way, it's, it's odd to be talking about non-gendered watches today. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you think it actually serves any kind of purpose, Leticia? Because you've worked quite closely within brands and you still work very closely with them, present, presenting their products and talking about them to the press. Do you think it actually serves any purpose to create this distinction? Is it useful for, um, is it create some kind of shortcut when you talk about it so people instantly know they're in a good space for people who aren't too sure about watches? Um, yes, I think on the one hand, it's a bit of a shortcut. So maybe for someone who doesn't know about watches and is sort of browsing the website, uh, they see, okay, women, I'll click on women's watches and I'll get a selection, right? So from that perspective, I think it's a bit of a shortcut. Um, I personally have never looked at watches as men or women. Uh, I never, I mean, even when I was 18 and I sort of got my first, you know, luxury watch, I never thought about it as a men or women's, but I think 
On the other hand, uh, now a lot of brands are removing gender and you can find them by size, by, you know, jeweled, no jewels, quartz, mechanical, etc. I think that that I would actually help provoke more of a thought process when you're selecting your watch, right? So you mm -hmm. would think, oh, actually, what's, you know, what size do I want? Um, do I want a big watch? How do I want to feel? How do I want it to look? Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the beginning, it's a shortcut, but in the long run, um, I think it, it, it helps, it like narrows the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Any as someone who literally does design as part of his life, as of his work, as your professional actual designation, is that something that actually makes a lot of sense to you when you think about who you're designing for? Is it useful to have an audience in mind? Does that help you kind of formulate, is the category men's washes or women's washes useful to you as a creator? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the audience is always important and um, also, it's so important to remember that it's it's an industry, right? So, you know, the nomenclature that's used within the industry when they're dealing with me to get to what they want, you mm -hmm. know, is what I have to navigate. So when somebody requests a woman's watch, I think more of, I think about the freedom of expression and the fashionability being a factor in what I'm making. I don't necessarily think that's gonna go to a woman, mm -hmm. but I think that's their way of saying there's a bit more freedom to make it something more fashion forward. Right. You think there's a better way to, to express that? I think there could be. Um, when I was working on the watch with Hermes, I would refer to my watch as a feminine watch. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that I felt like made it feminine was mostly due to the, the width of the strap. Um, and that's, that was my way of saying that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be for a man or a woman, but it has you know, qualities that would be considered feminine like the, as far as the elegance and fashionability, right? But mm -hmm. I also understand that within the industry, there's it takes time for things to evolve. Mm -hmm. And there was a time where these watches were gonna be fashionable gifts that were gonna be given to women. But now that we're in an age where that's not the case, um, it does, it probably should evolve a bit. Mm -hmm. So for you personally, it, the approach really changes whether you're designing for a more uh, masculine coded audience rather than a feminine coded audience. And I can see the sense of that because a lot of design, I mean, masculinity and femininity that exists on the spectrum. And as human people with personalities, individual personalities, we all have different sides to us. We have, a, we have some sort of aspects or attributes that are more masculine. We have some aspects that are a bit more feminine. We talk about people getting in touch with their feminine side or getting in touch with their masculine side, so on and so forth. So it makes sense to me to describe a watch as masculine or feminine, but not necessarily uh, for men or for women, because you're not necessarily checking inside someone's pants to see if they can wear a watch or not. However, the point that you raised about uh, fit and ergonomy perhaps plays quite a large part into how these watches are positioned, maybe? Yeah, I mean, even beyond getting to the positioning, just from, from that aspect, the ergonomics. Um, like, I don't want to keep referencing my watch, but the, the Gallo, one of the things that was important is that it needed to be comfortable for what is most likely going to be mostly female customers because that's who they're marketing it toward. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that it fit in a space where um, it didn't necessarily need to be gendered, right? So mm -hmm. the best way to do that is to say, okay, the most likely people that would be um, attracted to wearing this watch are probably going to have a certain wrist size. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm able to wear it. I have actually pretty small wrists, so when I wear it, I can wear it comfortably. And you know, you could also wear it comfortably, and it's going to be sized in a way where um, a man that's willing to wear a vintage watch, for example, which is usually smaller, would feel mm -hmm. comfortable, and also that a woman would also feel comfortable wearing it if she's of a smaller size. Mm -hmm. I like that because these are very strong, pragmatic points that are important to take into consideration, even uh, if we are talking about, you know, principles such as, you know, things should be free of categorizations, customers should be free to choose whatever they want to wear. Uh, Leticia, because of your experience, you know, talking about watches, presenting them, especially as new launches to journalists, to, you know, press, to people coming to watches for the first time, is that something that, I mean, what's your experience of being sort of 
you know, when you receive internal training for our brands about a new watch, this is a men's watch, this is a women's watch. And then when you relay that message, when you relay that communication, what sense do you get or what sort of feedback do you hear from people who are receiving that transferred information that this watch is meant for a certain audience and that watch is meant for a certain audience? So working mainly with the U.S. market, um, I think the press there is uh, very much gender-free in their approach. I'd say the majority. Um, they might say a watch is a bit more feminine, but still. Um, they actually don't like it that much when, I mean, some brands obviously still have gender. Um, and I have noticed kind of a, mm, you know, when we, so we generally don't use the genders when we present the watch. Mm -hmm. You try and leave it out completely, yeah. even though, because of the nature of the market. Yeah. Nature, yeah. nature mm -hmm. of the market, nature of the audience. Um, and because many times even we've been surprised, like a journalist, let's say a man will try on a watch that's mm -hmm. quote unquote for women, mm -hmm. and it looks great on his wrist. And yeah, I mean, I think it goes both ways, right? There's a lot of men that are wearing smaller watches today, watches that were considered small. Mm -hmm. uh, women's, uh, actually, if you go back to up to the 50s, men were wearing small watches. There was, you know, you have the Don't Louis Mini that's a big hit right now. So I think mm -hmm. it definitely goes both ways. I'm so happy you brought that point up because it links directly into what I was going to say next, which I'm aiming at you, Arthur, because we talk about sizing and, you know, what is would be considered more uh, a size that's more targeted towards men or a size more targeted towards women. But uh, yourself, with your experience, especially in the domain of vintage timepieces, I think you have quite some experience of how watch diameters, case diameters, has changed over the years and what's considered uh, a women's size today or so-called a women's size today wouldn't necessarily be the case even like 20, 25 years ago. Can you comment a bit on that and how sizing is something that really changes and it's not something definitive? Yeah, I think Eni made a really good point that we're talking about really the evolution of a product. And we're talking about uh, non-gendered watch, but really what we're talking about is non-gendered wristwatch. And the wristwatch is only 100 years old. It's actually quite new uh, when you look at you know, the history of horology. And during that 100 years, brands have, the, the product itself has evolved, right? Uh, it's, uh, we've gone through miniaturization of um, uh, complications. Uh, going up against quartz, and so for the for the past hundred years, the industry has had to kind of explain why people should be wearing watches, and what is a dive watch, what is a chronograph, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and maybe at some point along the way, they figured we also need to explain what is a man's watch and what is a woman's watch. I think we've we're getting past that, um, and we're getting past that because you know this this product is a hundred years old, and and today perhaps more than ever people understand what watches are. <laughs> uh, watches have entered the, you know, uh, pop culture. Mm -hmm. And it's great, we, we've, you know, these kinds of conversations are shaping really the market during the next hundred years. Um, talking specifically about wrist size and vintage watches, I mean, most vintage watches are smaller. Um, people are, I think, uh, starting to sh show a, a more appreciation towards watches that are slimmer um, and smaller, sorry. Um, but also, you know, talking more broadly about how things are evolving in the in the field of collecting, uh, auction houses are wel welcoming um, female buyers. Uh, you know, uh, much more today. I mean, it, it, female buyers are a much bigger part of uh, our general audience, uh, and I'm talking about uh, self-purchasing um, women. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of my top uh, clients was a woman, uh, and I t talk about top clients in terms of the number of watches that she bought and sold, and all of the watches are w watches that perhaps traditionally would have been presented as, um, you know, targeted for men. They're, you know, 40 millimeter sports watches, iconic watches, I don't need to name them, but that's what her collection was about, and that's what her collection is, you know, is still, still about. And n not once did we talk about a woman's watch or a man's watch. Mm -hmm. they, they were just watches that she liked. That's yeah, it. it's a reflection of personality rather than Absolutely. anatomy. 
really. Um, I'm glad you talked about like different markets and like sort of different cultures and how that plays into how people perceive um, what they wear on their wrists because you have obviously interactions with buyers and collectors and these are very sophisticated, fairly sophisticated uh, collectors with some extensive level of uh, watch knowledge. Um, in Singapore, which is where I'm from, uh, I can observe that in general, men actually do prefer smaller case diameters, uh, something that looks quite good on the wrist and you know can fit into a corporate environment and so on and so forth, whereas women uh, tend to favor the larger case diameters. And to me, uh, when I relate this to people in general, they, they find this a bit unintuitive, but uh, in your experience, because you have such wide experience with um, people across, buyers across different markets, are there any sort of, uh, I don't want to say generalizations, but maybe like characteristics that you've taken note of or how you, know, you can see tastes or uh, buying approaches kind of vary across regions and how would you somehow modify your approach to talking about watches depending on the person? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's very difficult to make generalizations. Just, um, you know, I, and I don't want to make any. Um, but maybe one is that uh, female clients are much easier <laughs> to deal with because they know what they want. <laughs> uh, is that generally, so? Yeah, generally when they, you know, when they show interest in a watch, they'll, they're going to bid on this watch and they're probably going to be bidding very competitively. Whereas, um, you know, generally male clients are rationalizing the purchase in a very different way and um, spend a bit more time. A another thing that I would say is a little bit different is that and I think both men and women, especially at Phillips, um, and you know, I, I would think this is true of any auction house uh, when they're buying cl a collectible watch, they they research the watch uh, and they know exactly what they're buying before they um, you know m make that final bid. But the numbers don't really matter, and in terms of like the intrinsic, the value of the piece, the future value of the piece, the, ma the, the that the numbers don't matter as much for women as they do for men. Mm -hmm. um, Mm, that's interesting. I want to. I'm probably going to touch back on that point a bit later because it's interesting your observation that women tend to come to the conversation a bit better prepared than men, which suggests that at the same time men are more open to conversations like that. But that also women are much more uh, strongly uh, invested in the decision making process themselves. They do a bit more of the homework on their end before coming to a conversation. Um, Leticia, I wanted to ask you about. Um, how things like naming a watch, putting it, categorizing it in one corner or other can actually be kind of difficult in the sales context. And I know your experience is mostly in communications and marketing and that side of things, but obviously these two are very much linked. How you market a watch depends, I mean, influences very much how it's perceived. How watch is perceived influences how it's sold. And anecdotally, I have heard from, you know, just friends, designers, people working at brands that, for example, labeling something a men's watch and presenting it to a woman who walks into a boutique, sees something that she likes, and then is told that it's a men's watch can somehow have a negative effect on her decision-making process to purchase. And it's the same, it goes for men as well. If he likes a piece, if, so, if, uh, if, if a man walks into a watch boutique, sees a piece that he likes, and then is told, informed, by the way, because one of our good friends has shared with us, a retailer, has shared with us that uh, she will feel obliged to share that information, that by the way, that piece you picked up, uh, very good choice, by the way, it's beautifully designed and all this and all that. I'm, I feel it's my duty to inform you that it's a women's watch. And that is immediately observable, that that kind of puts a damper on the situation. Um, how do you think it's possible to kind of change that from a marketing perspective, because it goes down the line in that sense? Thank you for bringing this up. I think it's a really important point because we, like you mentioned, we've heard a lot of stories of women that go into boutiques and they get kind of boxed into one category and same with men. Um, we're seeing more and more brands categorize watches by lifestyle. Uh, so, you know, maybe you're a pilot or uh, you like sailing, uh, whether you're a man or a woman. So I think that's a good approach. Uh, brand values also. Brands are talking more and more about what their values are and um, creating a community around a shared value system. So I think that's another way that mm -hmm. you could approach um, 
selling watches and marketing watches. So that you're not an alien. Basically, I, you share the values, so you belong in that tribe. It's not, oh, you're a man or you're a woman. Mm -hmm. So you're, you can have this type of watch or you can have this type of watch. Yeah. Ini, coming back to you, do you have a take on that, on how you, know, you would like to see how your product is um, something that you design, how it's perceived, how it's received, and the fact that applying a label on something may be helpful for some people to make a decision and could actually sort of stop people from going that final step and actually going towards that purchase decision? Um, yeah, I mean, from where I sit, when I'm in the process, in the process of uh, somebody purchasing a watch, I'm always just hoping that whoever's selling the watch is like really good at their job mm -hmm. and intuitive and doesn't make mistakes like driving people away from a sale. Uh, that seems kind of silly to me, but um, I do also I do also think that um, there's I, I tend to come from the product like focus perspective. If I walk into a shop and I would like a watch, and it was quote designed for a woman, then the high likelihood is if it has a leather bracelet, there's not going to be enough holes for it to fit on my wrist. Mm -hmm. So there is an obligation for the salesperson to say, "I know you like that watch." but we're going to have to modify that to fit you and the size of your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very practical reason why that could happen. Um, as far as, like, the categorization of watches and, and how they're presented, you know, I, I do think the lifestyle approach could work, but I also think that there should be room for, you know, the customers that are very into their either their masculinity or their femininity. I don't think it necessarily should needs to be, you know, like all kind of lumped together. I think that there there is a place for, you know, the customer that says, I want something that is like very pretty and very feminine, or I want something that is very kind of overtly masculine for whatever reason or however they want to project themselves to the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you see, I don't know, when, when I got, when I was living in, in Singapore, I, I remember some of the things that you mentioned where um, it was a place where there's a lot of business going on. Um, there are a lot of professional people, like male and female, and you did see a lot of women that, that go directly for, like, big watches that kind of represented, you know, what it represented in, that, in the business that they were working in. And then at the same time, Singapore being a very fashionable and luxurious place, when it came to fashion, nightlife, and, you know, like having a good time, you would see a lot of men with very fashion forward watches that would be considered smaller or dainty or more for a woman. Mm -hmm. So I do think that giving the customer kind of the, the uh, how do you say, like the structure and the guidelines to say, Context. like, hey, I, I know that I'm a man and, and I know that I present very masculine, but I do like to shop in the women's jewelry section, right? Because I like to be able to balance things, so I do think that there's that there is space to to actually have the extreme things kind of segmented. Mm -hmm. No, I mean because you're obviously someone who doesn't need to be told what to wear and what's for you and what's not for you, and I think it's really interesting that you brought that up. That sort of personal level of self-awareness, maybe of what you are and what the kind of things that you like, because people do make that comparison. That you know, when you go to a, when you go to buy clothes, there is still a men's section and there's still a women's section and you know there is nothing wrong with dividing things up that way but I think there is a difference personally because no consumer going shopping for clothes is buying clothes or wearing clothes for the first time if you're going to buy a shirt or a pair of jeans or whatever you know I just taking myself as an example, I know that if I want a bigger jacket with a certain kind of fit, I should probably go shop in not the men's department, but the boys department, because size stuff. But you know, that kind of situational context that kind of product knowledge is, is important when you know what you're looking for, and then you know where to find it. But for watches, especially for a lot of people who are buying watches for the first time in adulthood, who don't necessarily know that Yes, it's called a men's watch. Yes, it's called a women's watch. But I don't necessarily have to follow that because you're unsure of your purchase in the first place. And then sort of being imposed that sort of this is how we should think. Otherwise, you know, 
non, ça va pas, on fait pas comme ça. You know, this is not how we do it. I think that can be very intimidating and quite, um, yeah, sort of dampening. You like, you kind of like spoil the mood a bit. Like, you know, if you want something, you should get it. And if you know what you like, go ahead and get it. And you know, as someone who expresses himself as an experienced consumer in this aspect, perhaps you could see it also being applied to. Yeah, you know. As you're talking, I was thinking about it, and my shopping experience. When when I'm going shopping for certain things, I do actually find solace in the fact that I know I'm going to the women's section, right? Like when I'm buying necklaces, I know to avoid the men's section. <laughs> and this is, and and I don't really know what, what the answer is, but um, I do. I can't imagine that it can dampen the mood for for people if like if salespeople are. Um, not sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't bother me when, when you know, salespeople might point out you, the men's section is over there, and I and I tell them like, yeah, but I, I want, want, the, I want the largest size of that woman's ring, mm -hmm. right, to put on my pinky or, or wherever. It's I I don't have that big of a problem with it, but I can understand how it could be intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think that when we're talking about jewelry, when we're talking about watches. I think that the gender part is less, um, I think it can be less strict. I think masculine and feminine and then offering variety so that sizes can be adapted is probably the most logical thing to do, mm -hmm. right? From a sales and, and design perspective. Yes. Um, but with clothing, obviously, if I buy women's pants, they might not fit, yeah. I'm gonna come back to that in a bit because I do have a slight conflicting opinion in my from my perspective as someone with an extremely extremely tiny wrist it is 12 centimeters for those who can kind of imagine that it's tiny um, the fit is not so much about the diameter of the watch but how the bracelet yeah. joins onto it because I wear a 44 millimeter Panerai with ease and it's great I rock it and on the other hand, a 39 millimeter Royal Oak, although I adore this watch, is something that just doesn't fit and feel comfortable on the wrist because um, of the way the lugs join onto the case. Um, I want to ask the both of you now because you've been sort of smiling a bit and you know, got a bit of an amused look on the face. Is that something you encounter when you make personal purchases of watches and people tell you, uh, this is a women's watch, this is a men's watch, you shouldn't be this way, you shouldn't be that way. And especially if they don't necessarily recognize that you're someone who is already considered you know, quite an expert or someone with a high level of knowledge in this area. Don't, don't jump in. <laughs> yes, it has happened. It, it's usually at the beginning, you, again, you get categorized and then it's sort of, well, actually I'm looking more for this, but I think like Edie mentioned like, when I go shopping for a watch, I kind of know what I'm doing, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not shy about sort of, I'm looking for this style or this, and I enjoy a very good jewelry watch too, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, so I agree with what he was saying about the masculine and feminine. I think we just, let's not box in, but kind of a good retail person before presenting things will ask questions, mm -hmm. right? And get to know the potential client. And I think that's where you can have good conversation and direct someone. Mm -hmm. in the right direction. Yes. 100%. Uh -huh. Arthur, I think this mirrors very much what you said that it's about the individual customer and finding out what their preferences are and what they like before speaking to them in a particular way that's coded towards one direction or another. Because, you know. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely what we do. And, and in fact, we don't, we're lucky to be in a position where we're not selling, we're not, we don't represent like one brand or, you know, a few SKUs. We are presenting historical watches to enthusiasts and every you know every auction is different every time you have a new uh, lineup of watches and so we really let the uh, enthusiast the collector guide us uh, we really take our time getting to understand this person getting to understand their their personality what they have in their collection and therefore don't need anymore uh, what they want uh, to add to their collection and sometimes you accompany a client for years before they make a purchase mm -hmm. um, but it's a privileged position to be in because i understand that the salesperson who's in a, a retail environment 
when they see a client walk in, they need to make that sale then and there. At least that's how they probably feel. I, I don't know. I've never worked uh, in in watch retail, but um, yeah, it's a privileged position to be in, and, and I think it's really important. And you most often than not end up. In, in fact, I'd like to say every single time you end up guiding them towards a good decision. I, I don't have clients buy watches and then regret them. <laughs> No, um, you're right. That it's, I'm very glad you brought that up, actually, because we are talking from an extremely privileged person. I assume everyone in this room and everyone watching online right now this talk is in the position to say that they know a bit about watches or they've had the opportunity to uh, explore a bit, you know, what these products are about, what's good for them, what's not for them, what's to their taste, what's not to their taste. But for a lot of people coming to watches for the first time, stepping into a watch boutique, and being in that kind of retail environment where products are presented a certain way, um, there are so many questions, there are so many ifs, there are so many sort of like open-ended things in the mind that sometimes, you know, we're not thinking of people who aren't experts. We're not thinking of people who aren't very sure and need those sorts of guidelines. And I'm trying, I'm really trying to make the case for, you know, why we can still justify uh, categorizing watches by Sort of men's or women's in that kind of sectional way that we see uh, at the moment. Arthur, do you have any kind of take on what do you think might be a more nuanced but still helpful uh, retail approach in terms of how you know things are categorized, separated, um, communicated about, basically? Well, I don't think they should be separated, especially if you're talking to you know someone who's still trying to figure out what they what they like. Uh, why present or why push them to only see 50% of mm -hmm. the catalog? Yeah. You know, why not show them the entire catalog? So I, I'm not sure. I mean, this is a difficult question that a lot of people are pouring <laughs> um, hours into. Um, but I, I, I would I would say that the the best thing is to create an environment that's open and inviting and uh, giving enthusiasts the opportunity to see you know everything and I think it's important I mean I, I we're talking about novices but I think you're kind of always trying to figure out what you like I mean as you grow your taste change your risks get bigger in my case <laughs> as I get a bit fatter um, like you, you should be allowed to be into one type of watch st stylistically I mean and then later down the line decide that actually you want to change I, I think that's probably quite natural for most people in mm -hmm. terms of fashion and in terms of, you know, anything really, music, art, anything. Yeah. Um, any, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm supposing, I'm assuming that as a creative person, as a designer, the way that your work is presented is super important to you, is, is as important as the finished product itself. Do you kind of have any thoughts or any sort of wishes about how uh, this kind of retail environment, boutiques might be able to present creations in a more nuanced yet still structurally helpful, uh, you know, functional and like guided way for people who are coming to watches who may not be super experts and know what they want and know their own mind. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a pretty particular um, viewpoint on, on retail experiences. So I, I, I truly believe that a brand that's successful creates a retail experience that elevates um, the space to you know, almost like a spiritual space, right? Almost like a temple to that brand. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think if you if they truly curate the experience, then they're gonna be able to explain their perspective as a brand on femininity and masculinity in a way that it doesn't need to be compartmentalized necessarily, but it would be very clear that this is, you know, how we see Rolex femininity. This is how we see Hermes expressed in femininity and in masculinity and in, and in that sense you don't you know you don't need to put you know Adam on this side and Eve on this side they can stand next to each other and it's going to be clear you know what what you're trying to say right um, to make it uh, religious I guess and even more so having a clear perspective on how your brand expresses femininity and masculinity is important because I, I think if you're more clear about that then you don't need to actually create the boxes. It's gonna be obvious to anybody that they're gonna say, you know, the way that I relate to this brand and connect to this brand is, you know, 
sixty percent of it relates to the feminine attributes that they're expressing here, and forty percent of it is is over here. So I know exactly the amount of balance that I need from this brand for me in particular. Mm -hmm. That's true in a sense. Like it should be obvious. It shouldn't have to be said. I'm going to do like a little spot p poll survey of the people in the audience. When you're looking at the watch, any watch, are you ever confused looking at it and you can't decide is this a man's watch or a woman's watch or do you know? If you know, put your hand up. So that's interesting. I, so maybe my question wasn't clear enough. Do you always know when looking at a watch, even without being told whether it's for a man or a woman? If yes, hands up. Okay, a few more this time. So it seems like the majority of people actually do know. You don't have to be told that this watch is, you know, a masculine watch or a men's watch, or if you prefer to use that sort of uh, phrasing, a men's watch or a women's watch. You don't have to be told. It should be obvious, especially if the designer has done a good job and the, you know, the, the environment is, is good and, you know, it sort of communicates what the watch is about. You shouldn't have to, it, it shouldn't be, it should be self-explanatory, basically. Um, Leticia, I want to come back to you, actually, because it's something really interesting that you shared with me a bit earlier. You, you were showing me a picture of a really spectacular uh, gem set, um, high jewelry watch, in effect. And it's on display right here at Watches and Wonders at the Piaget Booth. If you want to stop by and, and see it and tell me what you discovered about it. So I was visiting the Piaget booth and um, my eyes went towards this beautiful gem set watch. And then I was told that this was actually um, not a replica, but a new edition of the 1989 Aura watch, cocktail watch that had been created for men, full gem set. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, ex they were exceptionally large stones. I think exceptionally they were large. I mean, it was pink, it's stunning. And white Please diamonds. Please go see it. Uh, absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it a lot when was we discussed even earlier, for example, you know, the Daytona with the rainbow gem set. Mm -hmm. Many, many men wear it, are interested in it, admire like the, the way that it's set you know, from a, from a gem perspective, mm -hmm. and yet no one is questioning like, oh, this should be a woman's watch. Mm -hmm. And it's a 40 millimeter watch in general, which is honestly not even that big. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I'm with Arthur where like, I, I no, it's an interesting I, for point me, to, I still yeah. don't understand why watches have to be gendered. It's an interesting point to jump out of, especially in the context of jewelry watches, which by the way, there was a talk a bit earlier about uh, jewelry watches which kind of did touch on gender-free watches or non-gender watches at the same time. So I feel like we're breaking kind of the conversation on loop here, but especially in terms of jewelry pieces and jewelry watches. Um, we have to remember that it was only until quite recently that jewelry was considered a thing for women. Historically speaking, if you go to any like sort of historical museum of art, you'll see these paintings and sculptures of, um, you know, really powerful men wearing huge pieces of jewelry. The best and the most magnificent pieces of jewelry were worn by men. It was a symbol of power. It was not a symbol of, it was not a signifier of femininity. And um, our, uh, as far as we perceive this sort of um, product wearing nowadays that, you know, it's got diamonds on it, it's for, it's for the ladies. And um, well, we all wear certain items of jewelry, whether we're into them or not. Uh, they're part of the sort of uh, accessories we wear every day. Even you yourself, obviously quite adventurous in the jewelry that you wear. You, you, you said earlier that you have very strong taste, you have very particular tastes. And uh, in terms of jewelry, when you go to like do a shopping environment or to a retail environment, and that sort of thing is communicated in that sense, do you think it's useful either for the brand, for the seller, or for a customer to have these kind of divisions and why not just kind of open them up in a way? Uh, I mean, I've had, I've had retail experiences where they aren't separated. Um, you know, s some brands are very clearly not making jewelry for, you know, in, in separation like that. Mm. Um, but 
like I said before, it, it just makes it makes things easier for me to know that I want to go to the women's section when I shop for jewelry. Um, you know, and and for me specifically, that that just works. I think also when you were talking about maybe the less sophisticated shopper, the less knowledgeable shopper, I think there's also a bit of comfort that can come knowing that they're not going to make decisions that might um, make them, you know, stand out societally when they don't want to. You have to remember, like for me, I have a very clear vision of how I present myself and what I want to purchase. But, you know, like another another guy might walk into a jewelry store and just say, you know, I heard that I would be more attractive if I had a necklace, so I'm gonna get a necklace. He has no idea what kind of necklace. He wants the, the salesperson to kind of guide him, and he's hoping that he's not gonna leave with that necklace and then get embarrassed when he walks outside, right? When I worked in retail, that was that was one of the most common things working in men's retail was that most of the guys would come in, they didn't necessarily know what's gonna fit them well, they just wanna make sure that they look cool when they leave, and if I put them in something and they leave and then somebody points and laughs at them, they're not going to necessarily say, be saying, I'm wearing this as a representation of me. They're going to be thinking, that guy just sold me something that makes me look silly, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, that we have to be aware of, of yes. both approaches. Of course, the comfort of the customer, both like as himself and also out in his environment. Yeah, and the, trusting that the brand isn't going to set him up to, to you know, have negative... Um, experiences so, right. out in society mm -hmm. so in a sense codes work these codes really do work but only they work best when you know how to interpret them uh, and uh, I'm gonna bounce that back to you for the final sort of uh, wrap up because I think we're almost down to the last minute Arthur as someone who's obviously in charge of the creative content and the sort of um, marketing aspect at Phillips Watchers that's very much about education about customer sensibilization and uh, making sure the right messages come through. Um, is there a certain stance or a certain position that you take when thinking of communication strategies or plans for the year or you know certain messages that you want to put out about the services and the products that Philips offers to its clientele? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, we think about these things. Our challenge, again, is that we're selling many different watches and they change every season so we don't we can't really as uh, any was presenting uh, think about our product over a you know one two or three year long strategy that's that's tough for us that's the challenge um, but certainly we do small things and I think you know big change requires small incremental efforts um, such as taking photos of the same watch on a man and on a woman's wrist and it's just informational it's just to show basically what we've been discussing that this watch might look you know much you know much bigger on a, on a, on a woman's wrist but again I, I'm kind of worried about that this discussion of size because I, you know, I talk to plenty of female collectors who wear big watches with big bracelets because they like to wear them loose like jewelry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they don't look at those watches as big watches. Um, but, I, yeah, again, to, I think you make small efforts. But we don't um, or try not to describe watches as masculine or feminine anymore. Um, just small things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Arthur. I, actually, thank you to my entire panel. Thank you to Watchers Wonders. Thank you to the entire audience. I'm not sure we've managed to come to a definitive conclusion today about what the future holds for gender categories and watchmaking and, you know, on the whole, but I hope we've given you a lot to think about. I'm sorry we didn't have time to take any questions from the audience today, but please feel free to approach and uh, approach any of us directly if you do have any burning questions you'd like to put to any of our speakers, myself included. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day at Watchers and Wonders and do pop by to see that watch because it is something stunning.